Hi everyone, Carissa here. Welcome to my channel, Wild Inside Wellness. Thank you for being here. Today's video I'm very excited about. We are going to dive into the first line of the major arcana in a tarot deck. If you are not familiar with what that is, I'll link a video above in which I break down uh, briefly an entire tarot deck. Um, and so we are just going to be doing a portion of the first portion of the tarot deck, which is the major arcana, which can be broken down and understood in various ways. I'm going to explain it in the way that I have always found the most helpful, which is to break it up into three lines. So we are going to go over the first line of tarot, starting with the fool and going with cards one through seven. That is the first line of the tarot. It's a really great place to start understanding the fool's journey, which is the journey of the tarot, especially the entire tarot deck, but especially the major arcana really illustrate the fool's journey. So that is the journey that we are going to start today. And please join me. Okay, so I wanted to show the entire line of the first line of the Major Arcana, including the Fool, which is numbered zero. So one through seven. So the first line compri is comprised of the Fool, the Magician, the High Priestess, the Empress, the Emperor, the Hierophant, the Lovers, and the Chariot. So we are going to go through one by one and dive into the details of each card. First card numbered zero is the Fool. The Fool is a card of new beginnings, a beginner's mind. A lot of key words for this card are innocence and openness, optimism, trust and faith. Curiosity is a really big one. Um, onward and upward is a major theme of this card. So the fool is someone that doesn't necessarily have all the answers, but they are filled with optimism and inspiration at their, the beginning of their journey as the first card in the tarot deck. It represents life force descending into consciousness, life force descending into the world of form. And that's a really exciting, high energy place to be. And, you know, the fool doesn't have all the answers, but they have a lot of curiosity, curiosity enough that they feel the nudges of inspiration to just kind of accept the step-by-step -step guidance that they're given, even if, you know, they can't see the next step in front of them. Even if the next step in front of them would potentially be off a cliff. Um, but that's not necessarily the case with the fool. If we kind of look at this from a different perspective, this could just be a moment of inspiration on a mountaintop under the sunshine filled with the life force energy and inspiration of divine creation and soaking that up for a moment. So even when the fool can't see the next step. They dare to dream big and to not let the judgments of others hold them back, which is where for me, the term play the fool can, it can go either way. It's either you're embracing the life force within you and you're trusting that wherever it guides you is good and is you'll be on solid ground or you'll be where you need to be, even if you're not on solid ground. And you know, the, potential negative connotation of this card, you know, when we look at the concept of playing the fool, it can be someone who is not quite aware, um, but that's also, also not always a negative thing. The fool has just enough awareness. Um, they have that connection to the superconscious. Remember, they are newly descended into the world of form into the world of manifestation. But when we look at the symbolism of this card, we can see the sun up in the corner shining brightly down on the fool. And the sun is representative of that universal life force energy, which lights the way and sustains us. More symbolism 
in this card are the mountains in the background, which mountains in tarot often represent attainment and achievement. And here in the Fool, they are off in the distance. So maybe a promise of goals to yet be set, things to yet be achieved, but the Fool is still standing there, taking in the view and really opening themselves up to inspiration and moment to moment creation. The other symbol that's really well known with this card is the little doggy down in the bottom. His animal companion could be seen as his spirit guide. Um, another um, interpretation is that of companionship, that we are not on this journey alone. And the last symbol in this picture that I want to comment on in this card is the white rose that he is holding in his hand. Rose um, by itself is representative, representative of passion and the white rose represents purity. So purity of passion. So the fool is kind of undiluted, undiluted um, from, you know, just like those things which can taint the human experience. The fool in their new state is very open to higher levels of consciousness and they are lifting the rose up to be in communication with those um, just bursts of inspiration. So that is the fool and we are going to move on now to the magician. Okay, so here's the Magician, card number one. And the Magician really represents the conscious mind. So the Fool was that level of consciousness newly descended into human form, kind of, you know, innocent and young and fresh, maybe, um, you know, a little naive, but curious and optimistic. Whereas the Magician is fully in the world of form and using all of the elements to bring about their desired outcome. So the magician is someone who is, you know, at least in one form of consciousness is very aware. Um, the use of the one arm raised up high and the other arm pointing down represents as above, so below. So the magician is someone who's aware of that connection to universal consciousness, which here is represented by the infinity symbol above their head being connected to the divine, that which is greater than, but recognizing that I'm right here in human form and I'm going to use the tools that I have been given to achieve my goals. So the magician is someone who knows everything they need to succeed is present. They are aware of their part in creation, of, in manifestation. So a big key word for the magician is manifestation, or you know, the magician is a manifester. They are a conduit of divine energy and a powerful communicator. And that communication can be of many things. It can be communication with the divine, communication within themselves, and communication with the world around them. So they represent the conscious mind and conscious control over this, you know, physical realm that we inhabit, but also conscious control of themselves. And those aspects of self, which here are represented by the different tools that the magician has, you know, they aren't always physical. Those are the different suits of the tarot which I will hold this up so you can see a little bit better. So the different suits, which come up again in the minor arcana and throughout the entire deck are the pentacles, the cups, the swords, and the wands. And each of those represent different elements and different aspects of consciousness. So I've said this in my overview of a tarot deck, but I'll say it again. The cups represent our emotional and imaginative self. The swords represent the human intellect, pentacles, the earth and body, and wands are will and creativity. So those are all the tools that the magician has to manifest, to create um, and direct their life. And 
the job, the role of the magician, of that magician energy, is to translate that life force energy into form and manifestation through the use of the tools that they have. And that is really, really powerful, but we'll see as we move along in the tarot deck that it is also limited. It is just one aspect of consciousness um, that even when mastered, um, there's still more to learn and there's still more to do and be and achieve, which we will get a little more into in the next card. Okay, so next card, number two, third card in the deck is the High Priestess. So whereas the magician represented the conscious mind, the high priestess is another just different level of consciousness, which is the subconscious mind. So the high priestess represents the aspect of self that is rooted in the divine, rooted in the superconscious and accessed through intuition. So intuition is one of the key words for the high priestess. Um, also thought of as intuitive knowing. Um, the high priestess is one who embraces all aspects of self, including that which is still unknown to you. So in the magician, they are someone who has conscious awareness of specific tools at their disposal. But the limiting aspect of the magician is that there are even, you know, maybe more tools or a deeper understanding of those tools to be had. And the high priestess is the first hint of that. So she, as of yet, you know, represents someone who sits in front of the veil. We're going to get into the symbolism a little bit in just a moment. Um, but she is poised between these two pillars sitting in front of the veil of the unknown. And she's holding a book of knowledge of the unknown. So she's someone who is very still within herself. She is receptive and changeable and even shadowy. She is the guardian of the shadow self who patiently tends the veil between light and darkness, which is the light pillar and the dark pillar. She sits between them in front of the veil of un the unknown. And the veil, you can see it's not, um, you would think the veil of the unknown would be kind of dark and mysterious, but it actually is very colorful. And those are pomegranates that are on it. So the pomegranates represent abundance in tarot. So even though it's the veil of the unknown, um, they are mysteries with the promise of abundance. Mysteries with promises yet to be fulfilled. So it is that the high priestess is that first kind of glimpse of the shadow self, but um, it's not a, you know, a negative experience of diving into one's shadows, which is you know, a common, uh, I guess, fear that a lot of people have that the shadow self is only home to, you know, potential negatives where this is the promise of abundance in looking deeper into your shadow self. Um, some other symbols in here. I mentioned the book of wisdom that she's holding. It is the book of wisdom and memory. And it's again, speaking to the promises that God or the universe has yet to reveal. So even in human form, we are all limited. We have wonderful tools at our disposal. We can learn more and dive more deeply into them. Um, but there's also, there's always a bit of unknown. And when we can connect to the subconscious, to our own inner wisdom, we can receive guidance and kind of use and integrate our experience in more deeply rich and meaningful ways. So to close this card, the high priestess represents the subconscious mind, which is often we run into the concepts of masculine and feminine uh, a lot in the tarot. And again, to remember that this speaks to energetic qualities. So the high priestess, you know, being that beacon of inner wisdom and receptivity is that's often seen as a more feminine 
trait, but this isn't, again, have anything to do with gender expression, but more of an energetic experience of being human. We all have the masculine and feminine within us. So with that, we are going to move on to the next card. Okay, so here we have yet again, more feminine energy, the Empress. And if we're looking at consciousness again remember magician representing conscious mind high priestess representing subconscious mind the empress is the first hint of the union between the two so the empress is the unification of the conscious and the subconscious minds she is animal wisdom she is mind body connection embodied wisdom and knowledge and appreciation of that power and appreciation of the wisdom of the body. So the Empress really represents our soft animal body. <laughs> she is creation on a physical and tangible level. She can represent fertility, fertile ground, love and beauty. She is really strong mother figure, mothering presence, nurturing, nurturative, when you get the high priest, I'm not the high priestess, sorry, the empress in a reading, it's a really, really strong card for um, nature, nature-based wisdom, mother nature, the great mother, and really being rooted in that experience, that experience of being an animal. Because even though we are humans and we have awareness of our different levels of consciousness we still have this gift of a body and the knowledge that comes with that a um, couple of other key words or phrases that come up with the empress are divine attraction law of attraction as within so without and the empress is really someone who embraces like i said body wisdom but body wisdom as being not superior to the intellect, but just as important, just as powerful. So the Empress is really strongly rooted in who she is. She's really comfortable in her body. She's often represented as pregnant. Um, and that pregnancy can be of, you know, you know, actually being pregnant. It can be creative, creative ideas, creative impulses, really wanting to give life to the powerful life force within. So some of the symbolism in this card are the plant life. So abundant forest in the background, the wheat in the foreground, and these represent ripeness, the ripeness and abundance of ideas. The stream, which is kind of hard to see way back along the edge, falling into a pool. And the water there represents the stream of life, the stream of consciousness that is flowing through all of which the empress is highly attuned to and highly aware of and embraces and the throne that she's sitting on is um represents a place of reclining she's very much at ease very much at rest and receptive to creation um, I find this a very radiant card. It's really a warm, comforting card. She's free from overthinking. Remember, she really is rooted in the body wisdom, not as much the wisdom as the intellect. So she's free from overthinking, which is a really nice place to be um, if you can get there. Um, harmony, beauty, um, very generous. The quote that I really think of when I think of the Empress is the mind knows, but the body is wise. And with that, we will move on to the Emperor. The Emperor. Number four, but the fifth card in the deck that we encounter. And on our journey of consciousness, here we are again back at a masculine card. And the masculine, just like the magician, representative, representing the active principle of creation. So the high priestess representing the subconscious and the empress representing the mind-body connection are really receptive and really um, open channels to creation. Whereas the magician and the emperor are more 
they're, they've received that energy and now they're doing something with it. Um, so the emperor is a card of structure, order, will, action, authority, and leadership. There's a lot of fatherly energy here, a lot of fire and power and strength. If you receive the emperor, it can be a really strong call to check out your boundaries because the emperor is one who has really strong boundaries. And these boundaries are rooted in rationality and reason. So we can see um, where the emperor differs from the empress, whereas the empress values animal wisdom. And just like the high priestess, that intuitive knowing, the emperor really values um, rationality and the wisdom of civilization and the rule of law and the rule of law as it is constructed by society. So this, the emperor is in a position that comes after the direct experience of nature. So the empress knows through direct experience, whereas the emperor knows through rationality and reason and the lessons of civilization. So, you know, perhaps lessons of the past. And one thing about this card is the imposition of this order. So, you know, rules um, are kind of a key thing that I think of when I think of the emperor, which have their benefits. All these things have their benefits, but the kind of sticky situation that the emperor gets into is that this prescribed order um, can kind of be depleting or limiting, really. If we look closely at the symbolism of this card, and this can be interpreted in different ways, but he's sitting on his throne and there's a barren desert in the background. And we think we can think of that as using that strong will, that force, that fire to create structure, to create something where there was once nothing. So civilization and flourishing and security and safety um, in the middle of the desert. And that is an achievement of civilization, an achievement of humankind. Um, it is no longer the wild, untamed garden of the empress, but, you know, potentially something depleted. So it's maybe not something that was created out of nothing, but something that was created out of the taking of something. And that's a potential, you know, reverse understanding of the emperor. Some symbolism beyond the desert in this card are the Ankh. He's holding the Egyptian Ankh in his hand, which is a symbol of life. Um, so it's kind of representing taking conscious control of one's um, resources to create life, but it's a certain kind of life. It's a prescribed order, which again has its benefits. So when you receive this card, it's you know a call to look at where you exert willpower and you know how is that benefiting you. Um, let's see, this card is ruled by Ares, who is Mars, who is the god of war. So again, civil with civilization, there is potential conflict and potential war. And those are represented, you know, Ares represented by the rams on the emperor's throne. And a quote that I really think of with the emperor, uh, or maybe not a quote, but just like a phrase, is that he has power and control over himself and by extension his environment and again the question to be asked is that beneficial not just to himself but to all that he would seek to rule over so lots of questions with the emperor we are going to move on to the next card okay so next card is the hierophant and this is number five the sixth card in the deck and the hierophant is the advisor. I often think of this card as the advisor to the emperor. Again, rooted in civilization, um, rooted in tradition. So the Hierophant is often um, in other decks known as the Pope. So it is that teacher of traditional, you know, established wisdom. Um, this card can be a call to seek out higher learning, generally of a civilized form. 
So whereas we see with like the more feminine paths to wisdom and embodying knowledge and wisdom, like with the high priestess and the empress, they experience wisdom and knowledge through direct knowing, through their direct experience, whereas the emperor and the hierophant are really rooted in tradition and learning from uh, the past, which again, just like the emperor has its benefits, but also has its limits. Um, when you get this card, it can be a call to, so maybe seek out higher forms of learning, um, but also just potentially from a mentor. So those higher forms of learning can come in the form of more traditional um, religions, perhaps. You know, having this card also called the Pope would indicate um, traditional religions, but there's also, there are other traditions that aren't experienced by all as necessarily religious. So it's just those traditions that are of a more prescribed order. There is a certain path, there is a certain way that one must go about um, seeking and gaining knowledge and wisdom. Um, so it's kind of an acceptance of doctrine as a path to higher wisdom, which again, not necessarily a bad thing, but limiting. There is a lot of symbolism in this card. I'm going to speak to a few of them. One that I find really interesting is the triple crown that the Hierophant is wearing. You can see there are three levels to it. The first level, closest to his head, has five, I guess, I don't know what those are called actually. Um, what would they be called? Um, tines. Um, it has five, line, a line of five, we'll call it, representative of the five senses. So it's a different embracing that one form of knowing. Line seven, which is the middle one, which speaks to the seven centers of the body, potentially. Um, also, this original seven planets. Um, so there's a little nod to astrology in there. And the top tier of his crown has three lines, which re represent three levels of consciousness. And we've already spoken to those, conscious, subconscious, and the one that I haven't quite spoken to much beyond the fool is the super consciousness. Um, so within the crown itself is, I kind of see this as, you know, it's a bit of um, appropriation in that there's a lot of different traditions within the wisdom that this being is teaching, which isn't, again, necessarily a bad thing. Depends on if that those traditions freely gave that wisdom or not. Um, but regardless, the Hierophant is in a position to dispense access to that wisdom, which is a bit problematic, potentially. Some other symbolism that we see with the Hierophant are, again, the two pillars, just like the High Priestess, but whereas she had the light and the shadow, the Hierophant has gray, which can represent spiritual balance. So it's the blending of the light and the dark, which again is the promise of civilization, that civilization can create a space of stability, which allows growth, again, a certain kind of growth. The crossed keys at the bottom are kind of the keys to consciousness. So this person is in a space of holding the keys to higher learning, the gateway to higher consciousness, or, you know, one particular understanding of higher consciousness. So this card represents the outer way to wisdom, which again can be very beneficial, but it is different from the way of direct knowing as indicated by the High Priestess and the Empress. And that is where we're going to stop with the Hierophant, and we're going to move on to the next card. All right, the Lovers, card six, number six, card seven in the deck. Um, there is a lot of symbolism in this card, uh, and it's not necessarily um, indicative of the deeper meaning of this card. It, th so this card's the key words are duality, balance, masculine and feminine, um, partnership, harmony, union of opposites. And a key, key word for this card is choice. 
So if we are looking at the journey that we've gone on so far with the other cards in the deck, we have kind of alternated between conscious and subconscious and conscious and subconscious um, and masculine and feminine. And here is the first time that kind of all of that is encapsulated within one card. And the imagery in this card is that of Adam and Eve and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's the snake. There's another tree on this side that's um, flaming. And maybe there's deeper meaning there. What I've always understood is that the flames represent the 12 houses, the 12 signs of the zodiac. So there's a lot of knowledge and wisdom that is all around them that is being offered. They are being given the choice to accept that knowledge and wisdom. And what, what do they want to do with it? Um, so they are presented with the possibility of integration. Um, this card, you know, of course, in a reading, the, the go-to, the impulse is to see it as, you know, the promise of a lover. But I think primarily it is the promise of balance within oneself, becoming to a place of, coming to a place of integrating the light and the shadow and integrating all of it into one whole vital human being, you know, and then from that space, you can be open to partnership um, of the highest order. But first, integrating the energies within yourself, being fully equipped with self-knowledge and wisdom and the freedom to make your own choices. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, so in the journey of the fool, which is the journey that we're on and going through the tarot, so we are now in a place of integration, the lovers indicates that support and connection are all around us and innate to the human experience. So just like the fool had that little animal companion, the lovers, you know, have all these resources around them. And the, you know, I really couldn't find an explanation of the angel that I particularly jived with, but I really see the symbolism in this card. You know, the sun is behind the angel, which is kind of in a position to bless them on their journey. The life, again, the sun represents the life force. The angels are kind of higher representatives of that life force. So it's kind of overseeing this journey of becoming a whole human and just kind of blessing it along its way. And they also can represent, again, we're speaking of the journey of consciousness that we're on. So, you know, the feminine, just like the high priestess and the empress, representing that more subconscious innate body wisdom. The man representing the, you know, that more masculine, conscious, directive, powerful energy. And then the angel representing that super conscious, that representative of the divine, of that high life force energy. Um, let's see, this card is really, um, yeah, the highest call for balance in the deck. Balance, especially within oneself, but also once that balance within oneself is achieved, one can then open themselves to ideal partnership to, and that can be, you know, of the lovers of a romantic variety. It can be um, ideal partnership in friendship, in um, business partners even. It's opening yourself up to companionship and, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, collaboration. Collaboration on this life's journey. Okay, moving on to the last card in this first line. And that card is the Chariot, which, gosh, this card is loaded with symbolism. Okay, so we left off with the Lovers, and the Lovers is in a, the Lovers are, is within oneself, in a position to make a choice knowing that they are a being of 
not just duality, but a divine being that within themselves, they hold the conscious, subconscious and superconscious and are able to create with it. The chariot represents self-knowledge um, of a higher order. So if we go all the way back to the magician, say the magician had that self-knowledge, but primarily on a conscious level. And the journey we've gone on since then is integrating conscious and subconscious and super conscious. And the driver of the chariot is very much aware of their mastery of being able to not only chart their own path, but oops, knowing that they have the tools necessary to chart their own path. Um, so obviously this person is going on a journey or even returning from a journey. This card is kind of reminiscent of what, um, like a, a parade of a homecoming parade, but really traditionally this card is viewed as a heading out of beginning a journey of having mastery over the chariot, um, over, which is really representative of the body. So having mastery over one's body and going where one directs one directs oneself so the driver of the chariot has an understanding of and control of the senses um, and has the free will to achieve mastery of the physical body so it's very much um, again the driver of the chariot is here represented by a masculine figure so that's someone who's going out in the world to do something but they also have the awareness of their connection to the subconscious and the superconscious. And they are very centered. And the interesting thing about this card is it can also be seen as the development the, of the ego. So this is, you know, the last card in the first line of tarot. And it is the, so far we've been on the journey of the ego, which is really the journey of the um, conscious mind. It's part of our human journey to develop a personality, to develop an ego, and to realize where that can take us and what we can do with that. And those can all be really beautiful, powerful things. But again, remember, we are just at the end of the first line. And again, just like the magician, um, we've learned a lot and we have a lot of tools, but there is more behind the veil. There is more to come on this journey of being human. It doesn't end with the development of the ego, that the ego has yet another journey to go on, which we will get to in the next video. But for now, I'm going to talk about the symbolism in this card. Uh, so front and center are the sphinxes, which are light and dark, which is kind of a nod to the pillars in the high priestess. They represent light and shadow, and also they are pulling the chariot. So it's acceptance of one's light and shadow and allowing both of them movement and to aid in one's progression. So it's embracing both aspects of self, the light and dark, the light and shadow self, and seeing them both as beneficial. And they both have a journey to take you on and perhaps they can even work together to get you where you want to go. The driver of the chariot is also holding a wand, which, you know, the wands represent creativity. And here in the magician, the um, wand was held aloft above his head, kind of drawing down the energy and directing it. Whereas here, the driver of the chariot kind of holds it front and center. It's in a really centered position, indicating that creativity is viewed in this context as subordinate to the mind. The mind is above creativity, um, which, you know, maybe sometimes, but that can be a really limiting perspective. So we'll see where it gets this driver. Um, to end this card, the chariot is one who can successfully direct one's life through force of will, through the force of the ego, um, which is always, you know, inspiring to witness and experience until it becomes limiting. It can become a cage. So again, it is not the end of the story. The driver of the chariot is learning 
to go with the flow and go with the rhythms of life. That is the journey that they are heading out on. Okay, so that was a lot of information. I hope that you can come back to it, maybe take notes and, or just like take the highlights, take what helps you leave what doesn't resonate because this is, you know, my interpretation and, you know, my interpretation of other people's interpretations of the cards. Everyone, every book, every person, every podcast that I've ever learned from has been funneled into my explanation of the cards. Um, and hopefully it's helpful for you. I really enjoyed um, researching and making this video. So if you do find it helpful, you know, leave some comments below, let me know, hit the like button, all of that. And I will for sure see you in the next video where we will get into the second line of the tarot and see where the journey of the chariot takes us.